Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benuli. Today is Tuesday, March 29, and we have a very special program that is going out live on YouTube and will also be recorded and published as well. Today we have Zoltan Pozar and Ira Harris. Zoltan is Credit Suisse Global Head of Short-Term Interest Rates and a former U.S. Federal Reserve and U.S. Treasury Department official. And Ira is independent trader, hedge fund manager, and global macro consultant trading foreign currencies, equities, bonds, and commodities for over 40 years. He was also a CME director from 1997 to 2003, and also a stint most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Richard, and uh, really thanks for Zoltan uh, for being here because this is a, a truly great pleasure and honor. So, you're on. The pleasure is mine. It's very nice to be here. Yeah. Great. I thought we'd begin with a discussion on your recent writings, uh, Zoltan, in terms of the the uh, paper you put out called Bretton Woods 3, if you'd like to give a, a short summary of that and wh what you had in mind. Yes, the, the, the short summary about Bretton Woods 3 is that um, I, think, I think we are basically uh, 30 days uh, or whenever the war started, 30 days into a completely new monetary regime, uh, a new inflation regime, and a new regime for interest rates. Um, again, you don't see most of this kind of regime change in, in real time, obviously, but I think changes have been triggered and, you know, five years, 10 years from now, when we will look back, um, I think I think we will look at uh, uh, the past couple of weeks as as a period of time where a number of things have happened. Uh, number one, I think uh, I think the status of not only the U.S. dollar, um, you know, G7 inside money, um, inside money being forms of uh, forms of money claims that are the liabilities of a central bank or the liabilities of a private bank or the liability of a government. That types of uh, of uh, of inside money, I think, the allure of uh, of, of such instruments uh, has diminished and, 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 and was tarnished uh, for certain countries. I mean, you know, the world is kind of evolving into this us versus them uh, block. Um, and, um, you know, here I, I specifically talk about the, the, the precedent of, uh, of freezing uh, half a trillion dollars worth of FX reserves uh, that, that belongs to, uh, to a major uh, commodity exporter in the world just to get just to get the details uh, right here I you know I, I like to emphasize to clients um, when I speak to them that Russia didn't have any treasury securities neither did they have any onshore US dollar exposure uh, they sold all their treasury securities in 2018 they don't have any branches in the United States. Russian banks don't have any branches in the United States. Uh, they don't really bank with U.S. financial institutions. All their dollars, but they have dollars, but the dollars they have are all euro dollars. And as both of you know very well, you know, euro dollars are stateless money. It's no one's liability. It's just, you know, ledger entries on, on bank balance sheets uh, uh, offshore. And, and a lot of these dollars that, that Russia had were lent in the FX swap market. And, you know, an FX swap is just a spot sale and, and forward commitment to repurchase dollars. But when you sell, when you sell dollars um, and you get euros and yen in exchange for them, you basically, as a central bank, get to deposit those balances at other central banks, like the Bundesbank and like the Bank of Japan. Um, and basically what the freezing of FX reserves meant in the case of Russia is that a lot of balances at the Bundesbank were frozen and a lot of balances at the Bank of Japan were frozen. If you, if you scroll through the Bloomberg headlines and the days when all these, uh, all these uh, freezings of the assets had happened, you, know, you saw that you know, the Bank of Japan and Japan went along, went along with the G7 to, to freeze the assets of, of the Russian central bank. So you know, the, the, the bigger point here is that 
you know, this this was a U.S. coordinated uh, effort for the G7 countries and G7 central banks to freeze the assets uh, of, uh, of of a, of another central bank from a from a quote unquote unfriendly jurisdiction. So this is big. Uh, it, this is not about the dollar. I think this is just as much about the euro as a as a as a as a reserve asset. And again, you know, uh, Australia is on friendly terms with um, Europe, obviously. But you know, if you if you think out loud, you probably can pick a number of countries that have, you know, potential geopolitical flashpoints with um, with the U.S. You know, diplomatic or military uh, in in the in the not so distant future. And it's certainly going to make these other central banks uh, and other countries think about what constitutes um, a good form of of FX reserve. So, so again, number one, one, one pillar of Bretton Woods three is that the world as we know it, where everybody is happy to export to the U.S., get paid in dollars, and recycle those dollars onshore or offshore in the euro dollar market. I think that whole mechanism has been damaged. It's inevitable that change will come out of that. You know, it's not immediate, but it's but it's inevitable. So that's one one aspect of of Bretton Woods Street. The other comes from you know this observation that I just mentioned. If G7 inside money is not what it used to be, and you have to diversify, what else do you do? I mean, you can buy gold uh, because gold is a monetary asset, and you know, in in the case of Russia, for example. Um, it's good for them to have a lot of physical gold in the basement of the central bank because it provides a useful uh, nominal anchor uh, to uh, to the currency in situations like this. Also, if it's uh, if it's not just um, you know switching from from paper money to the physical money, you can also think about Bretton Woods three in terms of alternatives to to getting paid in it for for commodities exported. You know, so you can invoice commodity exports in ruble. We've seen that example last week. You can invoice uh, trade between China and Saudi Arabia in terms of oil in, in renminbi, for example. So, you know, it's it's not only thinking about what else other than G7 inside money to buy gold, but also what other currencies you can invoice things and what other currencies can you start to accumulate surpluses in. Um, and And again, you know, the, the Bretton Woods three idea is that uh, is that this is a breaking point. You know, Bretton Woods one, everybody knows it. It was the it was the gold link to to, to the dollar. Bretton Woods two was the was the idea. You know, this is this is David David Folkert Landau and and um, and Mr. Dooley um, uh, just you know highlighting this symbiotic relationship between China and the U.S. to China exports accumulates dollars and invests everything in, in treasuries. And Bretton Woods 3 is probably going to be a hybrid of the two because we are back to physical anchors to currencies, you know, gold and, and perhaps other other commodities, but also not just the dollar, uh, but other currencies. Uh, and those are those are going to be currencies of the East, not currencies of the West. Well, very interesting and insightful. Your, your thoughts, Ira? Well, no, where Zoltan goes with this, and it was when he when he wrote this, I believe it was three weeks ago, he, he did three major pieces. So it was uh, three weeks in a row, and two of them were on the Ukraine. So the Bretton Woods argument was very interesting. And then, of course, we saw what the Russians did last, well, yeah, last week with uh, saying, well, they'll demand payment in rubles. And it's interesting, yeah. as I'm looking at my screen right now, when this, when the Ukrainian um, invasion uh, occurred on February 24th is our date, the ruble was 81 to 85 to the dollar. Today we're down to 87 to the dollar after being up to about, I don't know, 130, 140, whatever, yep. whatever we want to see on the screen. So that was a smart move because you say, well, we're not going to, I, I know that some of the Western countries said, well, we're not going to pay in rubles. Well, of course you are. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a matter of how you access those rubles. And I thought that was actually kind of brilliant because of the uh, Russian central bank under, uh, as I call her, Elvira, mistress of the dark, but I think she's such a, a fine central banker that for all the money printing that they may have had to done, 
had to do, they will have others absorb some of that in an effort to pay for the oil because those who are wishing for Russian oil to, uh, to go away, it, it's just not possible. It's, it, and when the media runs with those headlines, it's absolutely ludicrous. As my friend Mike Lies, who is a uh, great Kansas Wildcatter, told me yesterday, it, you, just, you don't just turn on a spigot. You know, it's not like going to your faucet and going, oh, let me have, uh, you know, I, I need another uh, two and a half million barrels of oil. It doesn't happen that way, first of all, because the oil sector has been so widely underinvested. And I, I know Zoltan talked about that. But the impact from, you know, from the way that I look at things, and I know that people who are listening to this will look at things, the global macro impact. And I think that Zoltan's points are, are very good. And it won't be, everybody's looking for it to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen tomorrow. You, there's going to have to be a structural shift, just like, you know, Bretton Woods is about a structural shift. Yeah. So if it takes place, and I, we saw the Saudis, you know, and, you know, people have to talk to each other in an administration. You can't be sitting there bashing the Saudis and then come hat in hand begging them to fulfill a need that you have. It's just, it's just not e that easy. And when the Saudis are talking about paying or having the Chinese pay, uh, for their oil in Yuan, uh, the world really gets interested. Uh, and everybody will, you know, the, the, the stalwarts of Wall Street who reside in a uh, Bretton Woods mindset, because the Bretton Woods mindset ensures that the, well, you know, what um, Giscard Destain called the exorbitant privilege of the United States. But of course, when we, we did the, with Michael Pettis, uh, a couple months ago, we talked about his view that it's an exorb exorbitant, uh, uh, certainly not a privilege, but an exorbitant burden. So things do change, but it will. It, it, and I, I'd like to hear Zoltan's opinion on that, that as we shift away from the dollar's role as reserve currency, yeah, I know, tell me about the legal standards and tell me, but things do shift. What will be the impact on US interest rates? Yes, uh, the, the impact will not be good. Is is what is what my in instinct would say. Would say. Uh, let me let me be, be, before we get to interest, let me let me just follow up on on, on some of the some of the, the fine thoughts you had there. You know, the, the the U.S. dollar was the you know our currency, your problem type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. with Russian commodities and you know pricing it in ruble, it's, it's kind of like our commodities, your problem, how you pay for it. But this is how I'm going to price it. Uh, so, so again, you know, just the fact that we had this kind of 1973 type arrangement where everything we import and you know move around in terms of commodities is priced in dollars. You know, that very practice is changing before before our eyes. And just to be clear, I mean, any any commodity exporter, and you know, in, in this case Russia, you know, you can demand payment um in rubles i mean as you mentioned i think the, the big question is who is going to be the marginal provider of rubles when uh, when basically transactions start to happen in, in rubles if it is the central bank the central bank can set the price wherever it wants to and it can set the price uh at a level that's much stronger than 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 the ruble euro exchange rate was uh before the conflict and you know you think like that as a central banker in in war times because you know you want to lower your interest rates and and all that stuff to um, to lessen the blow for for the domestic economy. So so there's that. Um, you know th there is um, th th there is also your ability to charge for things in in renminbi like the Saudis have done for, uh, for or floated that idea because you know you can then start to accumulate balances in a friendly jurisdiction you know that didn't sanction you um and so you know you, you, you can start accumulating rmb balances in the in the chinese banking system um and third you can also you know if you want to go wild uh, i mean you can expect you know demand uh, demand payments uh, for gas delivered in gold too you know i mean um if uh, if all these inside forms of money are just uh, are just not good. I mean, why don't you load a, a, a military cargo plane with gold bullion this week for delivery of gas tomorrow? Um, 
and so and so I think I think these are all 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 ideas to 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 consider as um, as potential as potential options here. In terms of in terms of what this means for interest rates in the U.S., I think I think the implications are huge. What basically people tend to forget is that you know. When commodity trades are financed in dollars, those are just euro dollars getting created. I mean, just to give you an example, JP Morgan makes a loan to Glencore. You know, you make a loan, create a deposit. Uh, Glencore uses those deposits to pay the Saudis, and then the Saudi monetary authority ends up with those dollars, uh, and then they show up at the next treasury auction. So on the margin, when commodity trade is being financed in dollars, um, dollars get created, um, and when when those dollars get created, they will ultimately get recycled into into treasury securities. When you break that loop, uh, you basically have a demand problem. And again, this is not going to be immediate, but over time, um, you will feel the impact. Um, uh, and you know this is this is basically a flow observation uh, where you're just not going to have uh, the creation of as many dollars on the margin. And then there's also a stock aspect to all this, which is, you know, when you look at the current existing FX reserves of, of some large reserve managers, do they diversify away from their existing holdings? Um, so there's the stock problem, there's the flow problem. And the combination of these for, for, for U.S. interest rates is, is not good. Now, you know, we live in a world of double entry bookkeeping, uh, and there is always a demand for treasury securities. It's just a, it's just a question of um can, guys my my problem is that there is drilling going on in the house because they are installing a um um a window in our in our living room um can we edit out the background noise yes we'll 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 do our best yes no problem okay so, sounds good um so, so so let me let me let me just get back to the to the train of thought i wanted to say that because you guys are probably um uh, wondering but so 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 there's there's this stock problem and then there's the flow problem and there's always going to be a different kind of demand for treasuries but you know if the demand for treasuries is, is going to come instead from the u.s central bank um and it's going to have to do qe just to kind of find the marginal bit for the treasury market that's obviously going to have an impact on the u.s dollar um and you know if, if the central bank doesn't want to do it directly, then obviously, oh, this is going to show up in the bond basis and much tighter swap spreads. And then the relative value hedge fund community is going to come in. And so you have either a central bank funded demand for treasuries directly, or you have central bank funded demand for treasuries indirectly through RV hedge funds, um, instead of you know large FX reserve managers, namely exporters of commodities and goods um, uh, doing doing the same type of recycling trades that they have been doing for the past uh, two, three decades. Um, uh, there is going to be a price impact uh, without a doubt. And, uh, and speaking of interest rates, uh, what do you make on the repo uh, market, the repurchase agreement? Market overnight lending, you see rates, uh, FRA, OIA, IS rates uh, as being indicative of a potential crisis? Well, um, um, look, uh, this, is, this is a crisis. But, you know, the conversation we are having about uh, the dollar and, and, and demand for treasuries and the creation of euro dollars on the margin, I think that is a quote unquote crisis of the international dollar. Um, and repo is mostly, you know, a story about the domestic dollar. I think, you know, the domestic parts of the money market are going to be fine. Um, uh, for OIS, I think that's, that's probably going to show up, um, you know, in, in terms of some structural widening in, 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 in for OIS, simply because if, 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 if the, it, or actually, it's it's an it's an interesting question. If if marginal dollars don't get created as much, and basically the world uh, turns away from from the dollar as as the currency that you invoice and finance everything in, it's actually I don't know whether that would mean a structural widening or or tightening of the basis. Uh, but actually, but but 
but I guess my instinct would say is that the dollar premium should structurally kind of fade away because less and less stuff is being um, uh, financed in, in dollars and, 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 and more and more trade is happening in other currencies. So, so that's probably something, something else to, to think about in the, in the medium term. I mean, certainly we are going to be talking about, you know, if, if foreign central banks don't buy treasuries and the Fed will have to buy more treasuries, that's certainly going to be a creation of more reserves. But those reserves that we are creating is basically substituting for the fact that there is not as much demand for dollars in the world. Um, and so um, thinking out loud, uh, it could it could might might well be the beginning of a regime where the cross currency basis becomes uh, positive uh, in a, for, for the US dollar uh, instead of instead of being instead of being negative. Um, And your thoughts, Ira? It's it's interesting. So, I mean, so let's so let's draw upon all your experience at the Federal Reserve. Okay. So yep. we we had talked about the reverse repo, and I know that there's nobody I don't think who knows more about the plumbing of that and has been right about it for so long. Um, but now we have uh, from the July meeting, which irritated me because when the Fed announced the standing repo facility and the massive size of it and how available it was to foreign entities, I think up to 60 billion and not just other central banks, but foreign yeah. entities. And the fact that the announcement came out five or six hours in an FT article prior to uh, uh, the FOMC statement that day. And then of course, Powell's press conference. So we have this standing repo facility, which, uh, which is the ability to, of course, um, pump massive amounts of liquidity on a global basis uh -huh. into the system. And I was upset because the G30 announced it before the Fed did. I thought that was really, yes. really bad. Uh, it, 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 it was just bad optics. It's, wait a minute, why is this happening? But do you think that, the, that they're relying too much on that standing uh, repo facility to, uh, to facilitate what they're going to need to do here going forward? Look, I think... Um... Uh, I think they have no choice but to rely on that on that um, standing repo facility because think about um, what money and money markets are all about. It's all about the marginal demand for cash and the marginal creation of that cash uh, through the lending and deposit creation process, right? So again, if you go back to the basic commodity trade, and if you think about every commodity trader as a as a levered entity where you borrow money to lease a ship, you borrow money to fill up a ship, um, you basically ship commodities from port A to port B, just to kind of capture the, the, the commodities side guys. I mean, it's all loans and deposits getting created and, and, and money is slushing around. But, but again, back to the euro dollar concept, this is all euro dollars that we are talking about. And these excess surpluses that end up with the exporters, that's what gets recycled at treasury auctions. If that cycle is broken, once again, right, then you start to invoice some of this in uh, renminbi, you start to invoice some of this in, um, in um, uh, rubles, or if you still, you know, uh, invoice it in, in dollars, but you know the the commodity price dynamics are basically pointing to a very messy and volatile world for inflation and interest rates, and the allure of treasuries just becomes less attractive because of that. And you know, people start buying equities or, or or other real assets. What you basically come back to is that whatever money is getting created on the margin isn't going into treasuries; it's going into a different currency or into a different asset class. And so someone else is going to have to create money on the margin to absorb the demand for treasuries that you know nobody wants now on the margin and so whether that's through pomos or tomos doesn't really matter uh, and i guess optically it's better for the fed if it's through tomos but if it's through tomos then it's the standing repo facility so so i think the the funny thing about these central bank i guess facilities and operations like 
some something changes and then nothing happens after a while after that change and then and then that new facility becomes the dominant thing that that we all look for 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 basically finding clearing prices so i think the standing repo facility is going to be structurally very important it's obviously not important now because we have one and a half trillion of cash in the reverse repo facility so we are at this you know excess cash environment but you know soon enough i think a year uh, year and a half from now we can we can very very easily imagine imagine a world where you know rrp is back down to zero and then on the margin the fed will have to add add liquidity um into the system with the standing repo facility so it's like like it or not i think it is a it is going to be a very important part of the system so richard if i may so so when we talk about the and you wrote so eloquently about it with the sanctions so the sanctions while uh, many people want to celebrate them as being so sterile and and clean and and it's having the effect. That seem that may be the appearance of the effect, you know. You know, and I just uh, I watched the um, the, the uh, interview with Dalib Singh on sixty Minutes. I watched it the next day because people I, I usually don't watch any type of news anymore it's over the years, and I used to be such a news junkie, but. I bother to, I'd rather read you than anything else I'm going to see, especially on uh, cable television. But, the, you know, the 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 uh, presentation of it was it was so nice and clean and we're having this impact. You know, my my first response being that I'm a uh, an, uh, an anti-Vietnam War uh, child. I was very active in it. And I, I kept thinking that I'm watching... Uh, 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 Robert McNamara talk, you know, because everything seems so neat and clean. And yep. when uh, and when she asked him, actually, uh, do you believe these sanctions are an act of war? And I think that's a very important question. She asked that question, and he said, "We." His response was, "We need to be very sober in our rhetoric." Mm -hmm. uh, that's a nice statement, but but picking up from where you've been with this and the sanctions, the sanctions long term effect is to undermine, maybe undermine is too strong a word, but to certainly question the, the, not just the reserve status of the dollar, but the entire global system. Now, of course, we can, we can certainly know that there is nothing to supplant it at this time. Europe has so many things to work out. And we don't even know where they're going to go with their balance sheet issues as this, uh, as Lagarde struggles, I think mightily, I think she's under a lot of pressure uh, we don't see it as much, but if you watch her press conference and listen to her, I think she's under a severe amount of pressure, especially from what we call the Hanseatic Five, uh, that things things are changing. But I look at the Chinese, and I and they've certainly had some sense of where they want us to go, and they were the first ones to talk about uh, central bank digital coins. Yep. And... You know, I, I talked about this with people that I think you would probably respect too, Zuloff, on, the, on these podcasts, by the way, and Mark Faber, and we've talked about this. And if the Chinese were certain, were really trying to disrupt, and they are and they are high quality disruptors in many ways, but if they were looking to disrupt the global monetary system, would they not create a digital uh, or a central bank digital coin that had some semblance of... Uh, well, I think you even wrote about it with uh, Keynes and the Bancor, but really some precious metal component. So if I had a, uh, a digital uh, uh, remimbi, but it was it had a 5% gold back and maybe a 10% silver back, would that even move more, especially with the impact of the sanctions and the way that they attacked the central bank, meaning the, the U.S. Uh, security uh, department apparatus that they went right after that, and they had figured that it was going to be a big thing, and they were holding that in their quiver. But with the Chinese move to solidify their currency with some uh, hard money backing in today's world fiat currency, would that would you see a, a, a structural change in that? So, look, uh, a couple of things. Yes, I think sanctions are. Are a, are a form of war, uh, without a doubt. Um, I mean, you know, we had we had what started as a diplomatic conflict uh, that turned into a military conflict, and then the sanctions came. So, 
you know, there's 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 a handful of domains of war, and 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 definitely sanctions are are one of them. The the one thing about sanctions which I'd like to highlight um, before we 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 go to China is, you know, the so first of all, thirty days ago, I mean, no no one would have thought that we would be having these types of conversations about you know commodity crisis, price level, inflation out of hand, you know, structurally inflation expectations, all, all this stuff, right? I mean, whole new whole new regime for for how we think about dollars as the reserve currency, what the Fed should do in, in, in a situation where, you know, you have a supply driven price problem, not a, not a demand driven price problem. So, so you know, I think this is all coming from um, the Western response um, to, again, what started as a, as a, as a, as a diplomatic uh, foreign policy type crisis. Now, the the odd thing about all this is that, and again, you know, I'm not I'm not a foreign policy expert, and you know, you know, Ian Bremmer knows these things a lot better than I do. But but just to be clear, I think n- nobody in the West, I think, who designed these sanctions, uh, assumed that we will be talking about these things 30 days from now, right? I mean, this is basically a completely new regime for financial stability and price stability. And and I think nobody thought about this uh, in, in sanctions design land simply because the sanctions by design exclude the commodity trade. You know, commodity flows, physical and related financial flows, are still supposed to be happening. Entities like Gazprom Bank are not sanctioned. Their assets were not frozen. They are not de-swifted. So you basically cocooned the commodity complex from the whole sanctions uh, uh, design process. But what ended up happening, you know, I guess unintended consequences of all this is that the private sector is sanctioning itself because it just doesn't want to touch any commodities coming out of Russia. It doesn't want to finance anyone, you know, moving uh, uh, commodities come out of Russia. You know, if you're a ship owner, you don't want to lease your ships to anyone who wants to move stuff out of Russia. So basically it's this self-sanctioning aspect of the private sector that is driving, I think this, this, this ferocious, uh, you know, financial and macro uh, kind of shock that that came out of the sanctions because again uh, uh, you know the, the the freezing of of the central bank's assets is is a is a big deal and we are talking about the medium term consequences of that de-swifting the russian banking system was not a big deal um you know everybody thought that to be the big thing but um including me but but it actually turned out to be to be a sleeper but again the the the, the impact on on the price level commodity prices um and because of that, you know, Fed policy down the line and, and long-term interest rates, inflation, inflation expectations, I think these these are kind of accidental um, aspects of all this because the pain on the West from this is 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 I think quite quite sizable and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So, so I think the sanctions the sanctions is, is is very interesting again because by intention the design was X and not by intention. The, the kind of collateral spillover impact of this is something quite dramatic and quite sizable uh, that, that I think took many people by surprise. So that's one. China. Um, again, I, I think, I think uh, there, there's two things here. Um, if you're China and you have a lot of FX reserves, simply because they're just a the poster child of, uh, of, uh, of FX reserve accumulation, what do you do other than treasuries? Um, again, I think the answer there is physical commodities. And again, it's not Bretton Woods one and Bretton Woods three, because, you know, gold is nice to have as a monetary anchor, but basically there is a smell of kind of resource inequality in all this. Um, uh, when, when you think about the next, you know, decade, it's, you know, if globalization is over instead of just in time supply chains and just in time provision of commodities, you know, James A. can actually calls this the you know the just in case accumulation of uh, of um, of uh, of commodities, whether it's fossil fuels or metals or grain, or a just in case 
duplication of supply chains. I mean, again, the next five to 10 decades, the, the next five to 10 years um, are going to be extremely commodity intensive. Um, I think commodities uh, inequality and resource inequality is probably going to replace income inequality as the as the as the biggest um, kind of topic that that governments are going to have to attack and 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 worry about. And in a world like that, um, it makes no sense to accumulate paper wealth. That number one is going the value of it is going to be eroded by inflation. The currency in which it's denominated is probably going to weaken for 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 things we we talked about before. And three, where you have a confiscation risk, if you come into you know conflict with with another great power in the South China Sea. Okay, so I think diversifying away from all this is imperative. Uh, gold is definitely going to be a part of the answer. Um, uh, you know, commodity stockpiles are also going to be um, a, 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 a part of the answer. And also, you know, this is just China's FX reserves, but, you know, you have other commodity exporters like the Saudis and, and Iran and, and Russia. You know, this is also going to mean that for other exporters, they are going to diversify away from the dollar and then accumulate surpluses in China. Now, th when I say this to clients, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, China is not, an open capital account. They are. They don't have the bonds to. You know, if you if you start accumulating surpluses, like what kind of asset are you going to buy? And, and so and so that's never going to happen. Basically, is, is the standard response, which which is nonsense. And it's nonsense because it's it's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg problem. And you know, you you know you you have your 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 father to a daughter, Ira, and I'm I'm a father to a daughter, and we all know that you know, children are are born babies and then they grow up to be uh, you know, grown up individuals. Currencies are not born reserve currencies. They grow up to be reserve currencies. So, you know, just think about what happened with, with China and the dollar. They started to export when they became a part of the World Trade Organization. Um, they started to accumulate surpluses in banks. And then they started to buy bills and then five-year treasuries, 10-year treasuries, then they started buying mortgages, then they funded CIC and they started to do private equity stuff. And then a central bank had so many, so many reserves that it basically said, we're not going to accumulate any of this stuff. You know, you banking system, please recycle all these, all these dollar surpluses through your books and fund one up one road and lend in the FX swap market or, or what have you. It's, it's a gradual process. So, you know, if, if, if Russia and the Saudis are going to start invoicing oil trades between China and, and their respective selves in RMB, they are going to start accumulating RMB balances in the Chinese banking system. And when there is so many balances that the Chinese banks say, we don't want to run with all these idle balances anymore, then the government is going to issue debt to soak up all that cash in the banking system and take it onto the government's balance sheet. But you know, this is how bits and pieces of becoming a reserve currency uh, come together. And then, and then the most important thing about this is everybody says that, well, but China has an ex anti closed capital account, and so I'm not going to go in there, which is fine. The US is an ex anti open capital account, but an ex ex post closed capital account if, um, if things don't go well. You know, it's the case, the case with the, 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 the Central Bank of Russia. So, ex ante open, ex post closed, or ex ante closed and ex post at some point, five, 10 years from now open, doesn't really matter. Um, so so I, think, I think we need to think in very realistic terms. And, and again, you know, the, China has been laying the groundworks and the plumbing for the internationalization of the, of the renminbi, but it's always wars. And it's always big world events that happen that become the catalyst for one currency to grow in importance and for another currency to, to, uh, to decline in importance. I mean, that was the story with sterling and the dollar. Uh, that was the story with, you know, dollar on gold and then dollar to euro dollar. And now this is what's going to be, this, this is what's going to be the story with uh, euro dollars and euro renminbi. Um, these things, these things are all um, happening. You know, this is such a great discussion because on these podcasts with the Financial Repression Authority, we have been discussing this. I mean, it began with Louis Gavay uh, uh, probably 18 months ago, but we discussed this because your point that 
everybody, when, when COVID started and the global economy started turning down, every analyst talked about, well, the Chinese would probably move to devalue the renminbi in some capacity. And yet that wasn't happening. We went from 6.9 to 6.8 to 6.7. And it actually, uh, I, I would talk about it quite a bit and, and others did too say something's going on here. And, and what it has to be because food prices weren't going down when everything else was going down. Everybody was talking about supply bottlenecks, but the Chinese had to be stockpiling everything from copper yep. to iron ore and certainly food. And it's interesting. And it was done with the renminbi or the yuan staying strong. And that was always, of course, right. Pettis' article. If you're going to move to a more middle-class economy, you want to enrich your economy by keeping a strong currency, which they've been, I mean, right now we're sitting and looking at the uh, yuan at three uh, at 6.37. Yeah. Um, so, and last Thursday, the Wall Street Journal came out because they were, they published, they did an article on global wheat stockpiles. Yep. Lo and behold, the Chinese have 50% of global wheat stockpiles, an 18 month supply. The US yep. is 6%. Uh, yep. So you see that they do have a game there. Now, yep. interestingly enough, because we're in the middle of now, every, everybody's got a comment about the weak yen, right? And, and, and yep. you can see it's shifting. It's not from being a haven and it's just, uh, energy price, prices soared. Uh, all of a sudden, China was deemed by uh, a lot of speculators to be, that's their weak link, and they drove the yen. And, and the Bank of Japan did nothing to stop it. Yep. But here's a very interesting point as we sit here. In 1994, on January, I don't even know if you were where you were at. You may have been, I, I'm not sure how old you are. But, I think I was in high school in 1994. <laughs> okay. So, the, the yen yuan was at 19, uh, was at 1922, meaning there was 19 yen to each yuan. On January right. 1st, with the advent of NAFTA, China depreciates the yuan from 5.8 to 8.7. And, and of course the yuan yen drops down from 1922 immediately down to like 12. So that was a significant move. Right now, we are right back at that level ending 1993 of the yen yuan. Yep. This, this is a critical factor because if the Chinese are content with letting the yuan strengthen even more, because they, they view, I mean, they import so much high highly engineered and improved technology from Japan, but there are areas that they do compete with Japan now. So the fact that this currency is back to where it was, uh, how many years ago? Oh, that's 29 years ago. Oh my God. Yep. Uh, so here we are. So I, your point is, is beautifully well taken because the Chinese are doing something. It's like you, you make the point and, and I, and I, and I think it's, it needs to be made is that, you know, People with dollars in zero interest rate environments, you know, they go out and buy Maseratis, Ferraris, Picassos. Mm -hmm. The Chinese actually have bought stuff to stockpile that they use. When yep. will that change? I don't know, but they have certainly uh, indulged in it and, uh, and have aided a lot of economies. But the, the question I think that, that will come is when they do make that shift, and you're, and it is, it's an interesting point you make that we go bit step by step by step. There's no big dynamic. There's no depreciation anymore of the yuan from 5.8 to 8.7. That's not happening. And there's no appreciation like that. Everything will be done in drips and drabs. So, yep. I, and it signals a lot to the world. And your beautiful point from the Breton three piece was at the end of the petrodollar, it mm -hmm. was allowing the Chinese to, use their muscle to buy discounted oil. So they were basically arbitraging the dollar yuan market, which was, yep. I, I mean, you, you made that point. And if you can expound on that a little bit more, I think it would help people because it's such a great point. Yeah, I think uh, you're, you're referring to, to how the, 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 the how China and PBOC can only be the can is the only player that can basically uh, arb the Russian and Russia commodities basis, right? Right. 
Yes. Yeah. I mean, the the idea the idea is 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 basically simple, right? So, you know, every every crisis is a crisis of collateral or funding. Um, you know, you 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 either have, I mean, you have the four prices of money, as as I've as I've learned yeah. from uh, Perry Merling. You know, the four prices of money are are par, interest foreign exchange and uh, and the price level uh, the, 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 the the price of the, the, the price of commodities and you know par is what broke in 2008 when you had bank runs and money fund shares uh, and it was one for one you know different forms of money that didn't work you know interest is always either about you know how many hikes up or down or bases between various uh, interest rates foreign exchange is you know 1997 we, we broke FX banks in Southeast Asia because FX reserves were missing, and and now we have you know commodities at the heart of everything that we are talking about, and there is this Russia non-Russia basis because it's like weird because this is a demand-driven supply shock, right? It's not a supply shock; it's a demand-driven supply shock, um, sanctions-driven, uh, right? Because nobody wants to be the next uh, Mark Rich. Um, and <laughs> Rich and Co, right? Because you know he was he was moving the wrong kind of oil, right? And, uh, and that's the birth of Glencore. You know the the downfall of Mark Rich and Co is is you know all the commodity traders you know started anew. So it's burned in your DNA what you can do and what you cannot do. Okay, and and um, and the other interesting thing about this this commodities basis that opened up is that. If you think about crises, you know, 1997, 2008, 2020, the job of a central bank in a crisis is you provide emergency liquidity to who, who needs it and you buy the problem asset. Okay, so you always do QE, asset purchases, and you always do emergency lending through, through some fancy facility. Okay, and typically when things are in the, in the domain of the nominal, okay, uh, money fund shares, you know, the par value of bank deposits, uh, uh, FX, FX, uh, FX rates, uh, cross currency basis, all these things, uh, bond basis, right? One central bank, the Fed, the ECB, whoever, can buy the trouble asset. It's a financial asset, and can lend to the regulated institutions, the dealers, and the and 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 the banks. The price level and the whole commodities complex is where real and nominal come together It's a nominal price for commodities but commodities are 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 real world things so so number one central banks are not very well placed to deal with any of this and if you think about the current crisis as a crisis of commodities it's a crisis of russian commodities which nobody wants to touch and move so western central bank is not going to be able to do anything uh, about the inflationary impact of this demand-driven supply shock, because they are the bank operating subsidiary of the, of the sovereigns that are driving the sanctions. Okay, you can only use um, tools like you know lending facilities if you need to lend to commodity traders, or you know interest rate hikes, or or, or, or what have you, to kind of deal with the implications of all this. But you cannot go and attack the root cause of the problem which is that someone needs to soak up all these commodities that are offline and circulated back into the world economy. That is a state, that actor who can do that and that clean that up is a state that dances to her own tunes. And it ain't the West, it's China. And so whether it's the PBOC buying these things directly or, or the PBOC issue, you know, buying the debt of a newly established, you know, state-owned corporation who's, who's job is going to, to build you know to buy ships and to build storage facilities for for energy and and uh, and metals and wheat uh, or, or or other foodstuffs um it doesn't matter if it's if it's if it's you know the pbs are doing it directly or or indirectly by financing a new a new state-owned company but basically that's where all the all the cleanup is going to occur that's the only place where this can occur and now when you when you kind of you know, uh, bring 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 all this into into the fold with uh, with uh, the, with the FX value of the renminbi. If you let the renminbi appreciate, 
you basically have a kind of commodity central bank of the world that is on friendly terms with the largest commodity producer, uh, has a large stockpile of commodities, and at the same time lets its currency appreciate for its own domestic uh, kind of reasons. This is bad for the West and double bad when you think about some of the things that the West is trying to do with you know, net zero emissions. You just have to look at Mark Carney's NAEP speech from, from last week. That's going to require a lot of investment. When you think about you know, Europe's desire to wean itself off of uh, Russian fossil fuels, but if you want to build steel mills, or, I'm sorry, if you want to mil- build windmills, you need concrete and steel for that. Right? If you want to build more atomic power plants, you need uranium for that. If you want to rearm, you need metals for that. And where is where are all those commodities going to come from? So I think, I think you know we. I mean, you know, you've been in this trade for a long time, Ira. But but you know, it's it's always been a kind of nominal game where the euro dollar is getting created day in day out every every, every single time. We have some crisis that's like in the nominal domain, some foreign exchange or some money fund breaks the buck or, you know, there's a giant overdraft and, you know, banks have to fund corporations instead of funding arbitrators and a bond basis blows up. And like you can easily deal with these things. Okay. Central banks are not well positioned to deal with any of these issues. These are, you know, the domain of states to kind of sort and figure out. But this is going to be a very complex five to 10 years. And, and I think it's time to start thinking differently because, you know, as, as I said earlier on, this is day 30 into a completely new regime and, you know, old, old ways of dealing with, with inflationary impulses, old ways of running your portfolio, old ways of constructing your portfolios. You have to all rethink it and, and, and go back to basics. It's like what Soros said that, you know, when, when, the, rules, when the game changes and the rules change, you got you to gotta adapt. It's time to adapt. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's that's really a great point. And we're going to wind up back at some point. You know, I I was in uh, university in the in the seventies and studying with some of the best Marxist minds uh, about the uh, petrodollars and the recycling of the petrodollars and the coming collapse in the Western banking system. And so when I went actually out to get a job, they kind of laughed at me because everybody said this is the best lending we're doing, right? But it takes a little while to work through some of this to understand it. And that was the, the birth of the petro dollar when the Saudis promised um, the U.S. that they would supply oil and the, and the U.S. promised uh, the Saudis that the dollar, they would do their best to keep the dollar a, uh, a responsible reserve currency after being delinked from uh, yeah, the, yep. uh, as Jacques Roof would say, the gold exchange standard. And, you know, so then, so then you get all that. So are we going to undermine that? We shall see. But I can't let you go because I have to discuss this with you. Your yes. views is where, where we are. Sorry, Richard, I'm uh, I'm preempting you here a little bit. Go ahead. go ahead. The yield curve is yes. is so interesting today, and you are. I'm, I'm gonna. You know, I know two or three or four very good plumbers of the of the uh, interest rate markets. James Aiken and and is certainly the best I know. And I read you because I have great respect for you. So can we can we look at the uh, the curve here and the way you yeah. see it? Because I I have some views on it, but I'm much more interested to hear you. I think people would be too. Look, um, I mean, I mean, I don't think the curve. I don't think the curve is right. I don't think the curve is right. I mean, the curve is is what it is either because you know central banks sit on a bu- sit on a bunch of duration and there's not enough and there's some structural reason why why the back end is so anchored and cannot really steepen i mean you know Gre- this has been haunting us ever since greenspan right i mean he called it the conundrum and then ben bernanke called it the savings glut and yeah so it, it's there you know you can't raise interest rates because you know you hike twice and then and it inverts so that so that's number one number two there is the, well, you know, we're going to over hike and there's going to be too much inflation and there's going to be a recession and blah, blah, blah. Rates are going down. Okay. Uh, number one, we just devoted the first, you know, 90% of our conversation to the idea that the savings glut is over, right? I mean, nobody has an incentive to add to G7 
G7 inside money portfolios anymore. You will probably diversify away from them. Um, and, you know, it's much better to stockpile on commodities than, 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 than paper money, number one. Or, or I mean, again, beautifully implicit in what you just said, just let your currency appreciate. I mean, that's another way out from, from all, these, all these reserves. And why the hell am I, you know, suppressing the value of my currency when there's all these issues that we are talking about? Let, let's just let it rip, you know, let, have, let, let, let that deliver some inflationary impulse to the West. Uh, meanwhile, you know, I stock up on, on cheap commodities and I let my currency appreciate and, you know, increase real value for my, the, the real wealth of my, of my consumers. So that's about to change, you know, demand for treasuries is going to change. If demand for treasuries changes, I mean, that's going to have an impact on the yield curve. But again, this is inevitable. It's not, Im it's not imminent. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, you know, the Fed is going to do QT, but we all understand it to be passive QT, where they are going to let the, the, the securities, you know, mature and, you know, the private sector is going to have to mo absorb more at auctions, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, however, you know, that's passive QT done by the Fed, but then that can also be paired with active QT from foreign central banks. The Fed doesn't buy because they are shrinking their portfolio. I'm not buying either because I don't want to add anything to it. Hell, I'm even selling on the margin because I want to I want to stockpile on commodities and I want to let my currency appreciate. So QT, I think, I think is going to get very complicated because we should not think about QT just in the context of um, of the Fed, but also what these other central banks are going to do. I mean, duration is duration, and it's warehoused in many different places for many different reasons. But basically, those warehouses are about to puke a lot of duration. Okay, so so I think there is going to be an impact from that on uh, on the yield curve for sure. Number one, number two. I mean, <clears throat> we are talking about these things, but the market is not really talking about this because. You know, depending on who you talk to, you know, certainly a, a part of the client base is is definitely of the mind. Well, you know, how long do you think Putin is going to be there? And you know, is this is going to be over? Or not over? It's going to be peace talks, and maybe all the commodities are going to come back, and growth is going to slow, and then commodity prices are going to fall. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, that's a view. But you know, if you if you again go back to the earlier parts of this conversation, there there's a very real chance that this is about something more structural and long lasting that's going to have a big impact on, on inflation expectations. Um, and the Fed can't really do anything about it because this is not 08 and it's not 2020 where you can raise and lower interest rates to, to police demand. This is about supply problems and central banks cannot do anything about, about supply problems. If anything, you know, governments are going to have to do something uh, about this, you know, stockpiling and, 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 and whatnot. But again, that is a fiscal spend, you know, whether you rearm or, or, or increase military spending or, or increase stuff, that's going to need financing. Um, and if that needs financing, that's additional supply. Um, and, 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 um, and, then the, and, then, and then the fourth thing I would say, again, you've been in the game long enough uh, to remember that you know, central banks, there's this, you know, opportunistic disinflation. I high creates, generate a recession, create some slack such that, you know, you know, inflation tames. And then it, 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 that was kind of the game. You know, that's like, that's what Greenspan did, right? Um, uh, opportunistic disinflation. Ever since Greenspan, we haven't had anything like that. I mean, we had a big recession in 08 and then we were growing. No, no recession, no nothing. Inflation was not a problem. And so, and so here we are again. So, what can a central bank do to um, to tame these things? Uh, 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 nothing really. And also think about think about where is the spending and the borrowing needs going to come from to deal with the next five to ten years? It's going to be coming from the government, right? Stockpiling, rearming, net zero emissions. It's going to come from corporations to duplicate supply chains, right? Uh, because it's it's prudent to do so. So there is going to be an increase in credit demand, but none of this credit demand is going to be sensitive to interest rates because it just has to be done. And it's a very big difference when you have a private, when, when you have an economy where the private sector is the main borrower, you know, interest rates up and down, and that's going to curb the credit demand of corporations and households versus 
when you have the government as the largest driver of, of, of credit demand because the government doesn't really care. And the government actually has a bank. It's called the central bank in its pocket. And, you know, sometimes the, uh, the, the, the very high level kind of state goals are, you know, uh, high asset prices and, and stable inflation, consumer economy, and sometimes it's, it's survival. Uh, rearm and you know restock and, and and all these things and and so and so the big question for me is basically yes the central bank is going to raise interest rates yes the central bank is going to do QT because that's the natural impulse to do when inflation you know is not a problem to inflation becomes a big problem the question of course is going to be are you going to raise rates enough to bring real interest rates positive and I think the answer there is no. Um, and if the answer is no, then the bond market is going to revolt. And if the bond market is going to revolt, it won't be able to revolt too much because the Fed occasionally is going to have to employ QE just to kind of calm down where the back end of the curve is. But just to be clear, I think the curve is absolutely wrong. I think the idea that rate hikes and all these commodity price drops are gonna cause a recession is incorrect. I think every government in the West is going to pull everything it has out to basically shield the impact of these commodity price moves on the consumer, which means that they're going to have to issue a lot uh, to, to basically buy at world prices and, and sell at home at, at subsidized prices. Um, and I think the implications for, of all this on the yield curve is, is pretty obvious and it's one way. It's just that the market hasn't really discounted the enormity and the complexity of all these issues yet. So yes, I, I'm, I'm glad we're having this discussion because I, I've been, uh, I mean, when I used to be on with Santelli all the time, we would talk yield curves and CNBC would always cut it short because, you know, you, well, you know it as well as anybody, you know, they don't wanna, it, it was making people's eyes glaze over. And I yeah. always look at the 530, Versus the two, to me, the 210 is a much more institutional where the 530 is always a speculative um, yeah. uh, curve as I like. And I'm a speculator, so I certainly understand it. And I'm watching this here and I've been I've been uh, uh, looking for for flatteners pretty dramatically. One of the reasons was because I know that the Fed with its huge balance sheet, but it doesn't hedge its portfolio. So we were yep. missing a huge player out of a potential seller as interest rates went up, they don't have to. They don't have to because as Jerome Powell told me, they have a printing press. So yep. ultimately that's the, that's the bottom line. But when I look at this 530 that we inverted yesterday, I think to negative seven, uh, and I look at it and I go, why would anybody, with everything you just said, why would anybody be taking on 25 more years of duration? I, I'm talking theoretically, of course. Yeah. And, and earn less in today's environment, which is so fraught with, yeah. with speed bumps of all kinds that we, nobody's ever seen this before because we've well, never seen it. You know, it's yes, you've never seen it before. And so you have to make a decision and it's the fork in the road and you either go left or you go right. And you know, there is, there is some monster at one and there is redemption at the other. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's some pension fund that says, you know, stocks are high. So maybe I'm just going to lock in, you know, uh, rates at this level and match my assets and liabilities and whatnot and, and call it a day. And others are going to say, you know, I just I just stay in equities because when inflation is high and bond yields are going to be policed to be low and the Fed is going to hike, but not enough. And real, you know, financial repression is about to get worse and speed up. You know, maybe equities are not a bad place to be and you know some some people think like that some people are buying bonds and um you know it's a smaller supply in the bond market so maybe that, that that's the impact that you see there but um but i do agree with you that it's weird yeah it's just it seems that we're we're getting to the end of it and on your wonderful piece you wrote before the beginning of the ukraine war where powell should seek his uh inner volker and i'm not a powell fan i i keep wondering why outside of political expediency he'd be reappointed for not just the politics of the progressives but you know i, I know that biden doesn't want to fight there so 
uh, and as somebody told me who's, who's very knowledgeable about inside Washington, is that they've been very happy because Powell has been so pro-employment uh, mm -hmm. that they can that even the progressives can live very comfortably with him because he stakes out that you know again as he would love to say and I call him the minister of social justice you know through no fault of their own it seemed to be his mantra uh, throughout all of this until uh, tr uh, inflation proved non-transitory -tran so. In, in your sense, in, in calling upon his inner Vol Volker, where, and, and this is a word they, they love to use now, but they don't define it. Larry Summers has been trying to define it. Yeah. What is neutral? Well, neutral, neutral, um, I think it's very, it's, it's, it's very high. It's, uh, it's not state dependent, you know. Uh, <laughs> neutral was what it was five years ago and 10 years ago. And, uh, with, uh, I mean, neutral is very high in Europe, probably, right? Right. Because yeah. you need to re rewire the grid from from an energy perspective. You need to rearm, and um, you need to uh, you need to restock on a bunch of stuff. You know, the U.S. needs to do a lot of the same, but again, you need to build the extra chip factory. I mean, you know, in, in the world in, in which we are talking about, you know, just think about your favorite, you know, mostly brand value added, you know, gizmo you hold in your hand. Um, that's got only a brand, but no real facilities. Maybe you just need to duplicate a lot of a lot of those production lines in in um, in, in, in the US, so whether it's chips or, or the assembly of of, of other popular items or or, 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 or or God knows what I think again you know the state needs states will rearm because trust is gone uh, you know as, as James Aitken would say just in time becomes just in case you duplicate supply chains you do you 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 beef up stockpiles of everything um, you you rearm and all of a sudden there is credit demand that's different there's a lot of credit demand from the state so that's higher base rates, right? And higher, higher R star and higher, you know, yield curve shifting higher. Um, it's credit demand for, for, from, from, you know, different corporations and, you know, credit demand that's not there to buy back stock and not to pay a fat dividend and not to take some company private, but like stuff to build stuff. Um, and, and then there is, you know, net net zero emissions and solar panels and wind wind turbines and whatever whatever net zero means, and that requires investment, and interest rates have to go higher on the back of that. So I don't know neutral. where neutral yeah. is, but it's definitely higher than what um, than what the market is thinking, and you know, it's as they say that one year, five year forward, that's at risk of kind of getting shocked higher. Once that happens, um, I think we're in a completely different regime for interest rates. Uh, not sure how much more time we have, Zoltan, but we have a question from one a little more. of our listeners. Great, yeah. Just a question on uh, uh, one of our listeners in terms of uh, your view of a new world order that is centered around commodity-based currencies in the East. Uh, what specific commodities do you like the best or you think make make the most sense from uh, an investor like in the Western world? What what, what investment would make uh, the most sense? Yes, and, and centered around specific commodities that, that might be interesting from this new world order. Right, right, right. Well, first of all, I didn't I didn't know we were live, so I'm quite I'm quite embarrassed for the background noise earlier, um, uh, because I, as I said, we have a my wife under the new window in the in the living room over the over the terrace, so they are drilling and putting it in. So sorry sorry for all for all the for all the the listeners. Um, so what what do you what do you do? Well, look, I think you buy gold. Uh, I think I think that's a very obvi obvious winner. Um, I think um, you know short short euro and long RMB. Um, uh, I think 
commodity traders actually not the commodity traders i think companies that own ships uh are probably another you know structural beneficiary to all this because again once once you have everything is shipped in commodity space right whether it's dry cargo or wet cargo again you need ships for that and um shipping rats are getting redrawn um you know instead of shipping stuff from northern russia to rotterdam you don't have to bring to china and then from china to rotterdam so you know everything's going to take more time you need bigger vessels for that so so again i think i think uh, shipping freight rates are are, are also a, a good way of, of of expressing some of these themes um and i think and i think uh, you know equities are, are are naturally going to benefit benefit from all this um some equities obviously not all um but uh, but again you know rates rates and credit uh are are i think going into a completely different um regime from here um so it's 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 um it's uh, it's it's some of those things that you uh that you want to think about but in your thoughts Ira? i'm not, i'm not going to add to it i mean it's uh, i think zoltan's uh pointing the question on because as we you know, we had uh, three three quote unquote giants uh, talk last week about how the Ukraine war was was uh, leading to deglobalization. We heard from Adam Posen, we heard from uh, Larry Fink of, of BlackRock, of course, and uh, and I, the the best one I thought was Howard Marks, of course, from uh, Oak Tree, who wrote a really good piece. So in, in that. In that reference point, I think that's where result knows that deglobalization. Uh, I think uh, from everything Zoltan said, would agree with it is will lead to higher to higher costs because first of all, you've had capital has been rewarded around the globe, certainly for the last thirty five years, and it's of course the basis of uh, Thomas uh, Piketty uh, with R is greater than G because. It, Global capital has been able to uh, arbitrage uh, the onslaught of uh, almost uh, probably a billion and a half new uh, workers into the market economy. It won't be able to take do that anymore, a and therefore the cost of, uh, of capital, I think, is, is going to rise dramatically, and the cost of labor is going to rise where where capital needs it. So I think we're going to go into a very very interesting point. Now, not all things are going to be equal. The emerging markets are going to become very interesting here because, especially if U.S. interest rates go up, if the dollar goes down, I think it'll make their lives easier because they're so borrowed in dollars. It's one of the, to me, massive negative fallouts that the Fed doesn't want to claim responsibility for, but the massive borrowing and not just sovereign borrowing in the emerging markets, but corporate borrowing in dollars is is really a uh, an outcome uh and as milton friedman would wonderfully say there's no free lunch so we spent we spend time and i know that's part of my task as a global macro person is to look to see where there is no free lunch and how it will um manifest itself into a tradable opportunity so that, that's where i would see that i'm not going to go specifically though yeah it's probably or it's probably there was a free lunch for a long time but if you are living on free lunches all the time, you get massive indigestion at some point. <laughs> That's what we are looking at now. Well, well said. Uh, well, awesome. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Zoltan and Ira. And how can our listeners learn more about your work, Zoltan? Do you have like a, a blog or a regular um, well, type uh, of Well, I have right? a, a regular uh, publication at, at, at Credit Suisse. And, and so if your listener is a, is a, is a Credit Suisse client and um, um, not done a distribution yet, then, you know, they should contact their Credit Suisse sales representative and they will get added to, to the distribution list. I, I'll, t I'll tell you for all your listeners, uh, I pick up Zoltan. He, he gets picked up by Forex Factory a lot. And that's where I find it. the articles may be a little bit older, but it gives me time to read them and not be rushed to read them. So uh, they do pick up uh, credits. Credit Suisse must have a uh, some type of uh, arrangement with them because that's where I can find your uh, articles. 
And then, of course, uh, after the last few articles you've written, everybody's been picking it up from the Financial Times to the Wall Street Journal to uh, even people on television who I, I don't think really ever bothered to uh, pay one ounce of attention to you, started uh, paying attention. So, yes, it's, I mean, I, I think it's been an interesting time because, you know, the past five years were 2015. It's kind of like the go the golden age of kind of micro plumbing because there's mm -hmm. lots of spread moves all related to Basel III and reserves and balance sheet and it was kind of micro macro. This is macro macro, <laughs> um, and you know I mean I've I've done a number of things in life and you know just digging into the shadow banking system and then after uh, after you know, my stint in the public sector, I, I did, did work with Paul McCulley about, you know, the long history of fiscal monetary cooperation and whatnot. So, you know, when you're in the seat, as you know, your, your role always evolves with the environment, you need to adapt. So I think it's now back to macro because, you know, when you think about those four prices of money, par and interest rate and bases for FX rates and, and the price level of things, this is about FX rates and price level, first and foremost, the next five to 10 years. And, you know, basis markets are going to be, I think, fairly boring, apart from this idea that, that we mentioned about the cross-currency basis potentially going positive in, in this environment. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a different environment. It's a different game. So, so you have to write about different things. So probably that's why it's a more more broad audience that that latched on to, to some of these things. Thank you very much for having me. No, oh, this awesome. is thank, thank you, you for so agreeing to, to do this. I think it's very enlightening. Hopefully we can do another one. And uh, the things that you write and where you're going, I think is very important for anybody who trades in this arena, especially global macro, to find their way and sift their way through it. You're really you've, you've been a uh, yeah, I, I really, I've been around a long time and uh, you're one of my first go to reads because especially in understanding the plumbing and looking at the plumbing because in order I'm a I started out primarily as a foreign exchange trader, believe it or not. So back in the 70s after the fall of Brenton Woods, that's what I had learned when I was in school about funding of uh, multinational corporations as they call them then. So I pay very close attention to the things that you've written about even before you delve back into the global macro. So thank, thank you. Very nice. It's very kind of you to say that. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sultan and Ira. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Sultan Richard, for hosting it. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.